Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 29th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. I'm your host, Steve Patterson, and as you might imagine, today, with the upcoming presidential election in the United States, we're talking about politics. To join me, I'm speaking with a man who has been teaching at Harvard University for more than two of my lifetimes. I'm speaking with the distinguished Dr. Harvey Mansfield, who has been a professor at Harvard since 1962. But before we start, I want to give a special round of shout outs to some new Patreon supporters. Mike Fershing, Brent Bowers, Brian Miller, Michael Jesus Segura, and Steve Wilson. Thank you all so much for contributing to the show and helping create a rational worldview. And thank you to the more than 50 other patrons who are also helping to support the show. In addition, I've just added a PayPal option on my website if you want to support the show that way. And I've already got some people donating through PayPal, so thank you all so much. So what's interesting about Dr. Mansfield is he's a conservative at Harvard and has been that way for quite a long time. As you can imagine, he's seen a lot of things. So being a conservative, I wanted to ask him about this crazy 2016 election, what his thoughts are on Trump. And he's also known for having some slightly provocative ideas about welfare, about political correctness, and even about my favorite topic, academia. Near the end of this interview, he shares his analysis of the current state of academia and some interesting stories back when there was a lot of student demonstrations in the 60s. So seeing what he has seen and having the worldview that he does, he was very sympathetic to some of my criticisms of academia, as I know you guys, the listeners, are as well. So if you're currently going to college or thinking of going to college but not sure, the sponsor for the show is the company Praxis, which specializes in taking young people who are ambitious and want a taste of the real world either out of academia or before they go into academia, and placing them at a paid apprenticeship. The Praxis program is three months of professional boot camp, which teaches you actual real-world job skills, followed by a six-month paid apprenticeship. And after you complete their program, they contractually guarantee you a $40,000 a year job offer. And if that weren't enticing enough, the net cost of the program to Praxis participants is $0. So that sounds like something that you're interested in. Head over to discoverpraxis.com. On their homepage, they have a button that says schedule a call. Click it, schedule an appointment, and see if it's right for you. So back to the interview. Dr. Harvey Mansfield is the professor of government at Harvard University, where he's been teaching for more than half a century. He's also a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. He's the author of many books, in addition to many articles, as you can imagine. All right, that's enough for me. Hope you guys like it. So first of all, Dr. Mansfields, I want to thank you for sitting down and taking the time to talk with me today. This is a crazy election cycle, so I appreciate uh, you being here. It's a pleasure. What I'd like to do is get your analysis on this particular election season, just because it's such a, a crazy election. You've been involved in politics and analyzing politics for many decades now. And then I figured that analysis we can talk will probably prompt us talking deeper into political philosophy and conservative political philosophy, and Mm -hmm. I'd like to get your um, analysis on several issues. Mm -hmm. So when you see the Trump phenomenon, when I look at it, it strikes me as reactionary, not in a a bad sense, just in a descriptive sense, that people are so angered by a lot of the the nonsense that's been happening in the political world for so long. They're angered by a lot of what they see as um, a, a, a cultural leftism, you might call it. And this is, they have the one guy, Trump, this guy's going to smash the establishment. We're going to take our country back. When you see the Trump phenomena, do you have the same analysis? Do you think that this ultimately is something that is a reaction to the left? Or is it based on uh, sounder principles, you think? Uh, I don't think it's based on sound principles. <laughs> But it, uh, it is something of a reaction to the left. Certainly Trump made a lot of headway by speaking against political correctness. Mm-hmm. He's, that impressed me, for example, uh, and many others too. That's a situation in our society, or you might say culture. So uh, I think that uh, the anger you mentioned that's behind him is more cultural than economic, though uh, uh, your, your culture sense can be activated by if you lack a job. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but still, uh, still, I think it's mostly a, a, a dislike of the ways of thinking that are imposed on us. 
that's political correctness. Political means uh, it's 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 been imposed, and correctness means uh, that's an ironic term. The phrase comes from the Communist Party in, in the 20s and 30s. Um, they where it was used, uh, those who follow the party line are in a good sense politically correct, but they also used it in a satirical or ironical sense. Uh, meaning referring to people who are overly correct, who go too far. Uh, and I think uh, now that it's, it's become totally uh, ironic, and it's, a, it's not a term of praise at all. So politically correct. As, and it was, I think it's been put by a couple of people pretty well when they say that um, there's a distinction in our country right now between those who are protected and those who are not protected. And the protected ones are the politically correct, and they're protected by political correction. Hmm. And those will be blacks and women, and uh, to some extent Asians, American Indians, minorities, or in the case of women, majority that is uh, uh, that is oppressed. And and um, the, and the measures of political correctness are intended to address this, and to give them privileges which others don't have. So, um, yeah, and, and, and you see it also, here's another phrase, in affirmative action. Um, and affirmative action is, uh, is re the reserving of good things, jobs or honors, to these oppressed minorities. And um, w when you do that, you're um, Adopting affirmative action or the uh, sort of being vulnerable to oppression as uh, as something else besides just deserving, or you deserve it because you're vulnerable, hmm. as opposed to those who are not supposed to be or not held to be vulnerable, and those are the ones who are unprotected. So uh, when there's affirmative action, some people are given the benefit of it which is called being inclusive, but then others are not given the benefit of it, but that's not called being excluded. Nonetheless, uh, it's a, it's a zero-sum game, and you can't prefer some without excluding others. So, and those others who are excluded are excluded so as we can all praise ourselves for being inclusive. <laughs> that's, um, so, I, th I think this sense of, uh, being honored or dishonored, it's more a matter of honor like the, than of gain. That comes back to my point that it's not so much economic. So when people are getting fired up by the Trump phenomenon, you think this is primarily an unbubbling culture war that people are so fed up with being excluded, maybe even explicitly excluded, yeah. that they see an opportunity to finally change that system. Uh, they see an opportunity to at least to overturn it or to uh, create a little what they hope will be creative chaos. Now, do you uh, think? In, do you think that there is a connection there between reality? So, is it the case that by electing somebody like a Donald Trump, these things would change, or is this uh, is this kind of a distraction? Is if if this is a cultural problem, maybe going the political route isn't the way to solve cultural problems. Yeah. Well, Donald Trump, I think, is a c kind of classic demagogue. He, he's not so much concerned with uh, principles or policies or ideas as with being loved. He wants to be loved by everybody. If, you're, if you love him, you're a fan of his, and then he likes you. And to do this, he's willing to <laughs> accept the love of anyone, and particularly the most uh, vulgar, to use a very old-fashioned word which applies, I think, to uh, Trump's uh, supporters. So, um, so but, but on the other hand, uh, he was able to do this through an institution, uh, the Republican Party, and running for uh, an establishment office, President of the United States, um, which is a little bit different from the classic demagogue, and was meant hmm by the founders of the people who made our Constitution to get in the way of, make things difficult for people like Donald Trump. 
And so maybe if he loses, uh, we, we'll see the, sort of the, the, the victory of the Constitution, uh, or what's called the establishment, uh, um, at the end. But uh, he's certainly given everything a, um, a, a turn, every one a turn, and, uh, and uh, cast a shadow. Makes, uh, makes the whole scene look quite ominous. Right yes. Now. So let's play out that scenario. Let's say that Donald Trump loses. <clears throat> this anger is not going to go away. So what do you do? You think that Donald Trump might be the devil that we know, and we'll see what comes around next election cycle, or do you think that this anger is going to? It's got something's got to happen, right? If it's not his election. Well, uh, yeah, it could be a classic case of the purging, a purgation of, of anger. <laughs> um, if you get smacked hard, if he loses substantially, say, gets fewer votes than Mitt Romney, the person he laughed at for being a loser, then uh, I think that's, that's a, a kick in the stomach. Or <laughs> for him. That, but I don't know all him, those supporters. Well, but, right, I, uh, I, you know, they, they will face the... Uh, the They'll, they'll face the, the declaration that they uh, brought this on themselves and that they led us, we Republicans, uh, into defeat. And uh, what can they answer to that? Uh, it's also, the whole situation is an instance of democratic and especially American impatience. Mm -hmm. Our Constitution is designed to make us more patient than we are in our nature slow things down. Mm, slow things down by giving lots of people opportunity to uh, interrupt, to make their point, with the ultimate goal that the final result, so the, the majority that passes the law, will be more moderate than it would have been otherwise. So, uh, and so, so it's that, that's part of it too, just impatience and anger. And the thing about such impatience is that it passes or can easily pass. So um, maybe having brought us uh, to a debacle of having to vote for uh, uh, Donald Trump or for Hillary Clinton, we have to look at the other side too, by exactly, the way. Exactly, exactly. Let's, yeah. let's do that. So uh, when you when you personally look at those choices, well, you, there are other choices, li Libertarian Gary Johnson and Green Party Jill Stein, those are also choices. Yes. Um, for somebody that has been in the conservative movement for a long time, mm -hmm. what do you do? Do you hold your right. nose and vote for Donald, or do you say, I can't, in yeah. good conscience? Well, what I'm going to do, I think, <laughs> yeah, I've taken a long time to decide, and uh, well, I, I've certainly considered voting for it. Donald, I, I don't. Re I certainly don't want to vote for Hillary Clinton, but I think I'm going to vote uh, for Mike Pence right in, <laughs> something like that. Uh, and that's a protest vote. Um, and by the way, part of this uh, situation too is uh, is Bernie Sanders. We have to look. The whole situation includes the Democrats, and and they have had, they had a very near thing of it almost, to get a man who uh, calls himself a, a socialist yeah. and not even a, a Democrat. And he almost hijacked the Democratic Party the way, the way Trump did the, the Republican. So let me ask you on that note, that, uh, a few months ago, I, um, when Bernie was still in it and it was, looked like Trump was going to get the Republican nomination and it was uncertain with Bernie, from my perspective, because I'm very much jaded by politics and now consider myself a libertarian, mm -hmm. it seems like almost a condemnation or a demonstration of the fundamental issues in the political system that we have that these two people mm -hmm. could potentially, an explicit socialist, which is mm -hmm. remarkable and disturbing, and mm -hmm. Donald Trump, which is also remarkable and disturbing. Mm -hmm. So doesn't that kind of condemn the whole system that such a thing could mm -hmm. happen. I think it, what it condemns is more the situation than the system. The, um, uh, the situation is the 
So I would, say, I would call it the twilight of the welfare state. That, hmm. uh, that is uh, the giving benefits and taxing the people to provide the benefits and asking for their vote on the basis of the benefits. And over the long haul, say, say since the 1930s, uh, uh, th that has worked pretty well to the advantage of the Democrats. And, and also to the Republicans when they've gone along with the Democrats. But I think that's now coming to an end because I think it's now beginning to be evident that the people are willing to vote themselves benefits that they're not willing to vote payment for. Hmm. And, and uh, I, th I think with the doubling of the national debt under Obama, with the continuation of quantitative ease, which, which can only go on so long. Quantitative easing uh, makes the cost of the debt much less than it otherwise would be, it makes it really sustainable. But the trouble is that quantitative easing doesn't seem to be sustainable. So uh, the Democrats are very good at finding expedients like this to make things continue. but. Uh, Right, right now, say their present campaign is against Trump. It isn't in, on behalf of further increments to the welfare state, though to be sure uh, Hillary Clinton has, has proposed you know, child care and, and pre-kindergarten uh, uh, schooling and so on, and student loans, all these things for their constituencies. But uh, how are we going to pay for those? So I, I think there is a kind of uneasy sense, uh, generally, that uh, um, in both parties that, uh, that this is coming to an end, and that we now face uh, a period of uh, austerity. And this, despite the fact that neither candidate speaks at all of austerity, to put it mildly, but I think that people are aware of this. And this, I th I th this is, would be my explanation for uh, the Democrats' uh, affair with Bernie Sanders. They, uh, they begin to see that, uh, that welfare state or social democracy is not really viable, certainly not in this country, and uh, it's also too costly. In Europe, they're having similar difficulties. Not to mention the example of Greece, as it were, um, of people that uh, voted excessive benefits to itself through government has come to grief, really. Um, that, that, that this is uh, coming to be over, and so they want to defend the whole system as a whole, and, that, and they don't mind calling it socialism, <laughs> um, which was always perhaps what the Republicans wanted to call it <laughs> and, and, you know, name it correctly rather than politically. So, uh, so, so I, you know, that, that would be my sense. And then, but, but then the trouble is uh, uh, you, you can't, neither party can afford to be the beginner of austerity. And it seems, it seems some kind of mm crisis will, some, some, some event will have to occur which forces us to, as a people, to face this um, difficulty. And um, I don't know what that will be. That could be in foreign policy, not necessarily in domestic policy, but trouble for the dollar or uh, pensions, entitlements, um, or um, Financial systems, the stock market. So when so you all these po are possibilities, but I guess so. so I, th I think it's we're headed into a queasy situation. So when you see the promises that have resulted in a twenty trillion dollar national debt, you said that you were thinking that some of the democratic. Um, uh, the allure that Bernie Sanders held for them was seeing that maybe this system is not sustainable, that there's something wrong. But when you said that, I was thinking, that sounds rude, but that might give them too much credit. 
And I say that because I see little evidence uh -huh. that people <laughs> care about yeah. economic rationality, that mm -hmm. they view the national debt as mm -hmm. something that has never been dealt with and therefore never will need to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of that, but I, I think that's, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm inclined to adopt a, a psychological view, <laughs> which I usually dislike. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Uh, that that uh, this is uh, uh, kind of an official view that people people use to suppress their anxieties, ah. which uh, which are closer to the closer to the truth. Uh, in any case, I, I I was going to I was contrasting the situation with the system, the, the system of the cons constitutional system with Congress and President and the court and Supreme Court and so on, three powers separated by. That, and federalism, that, I don't think that that is really in question, or, or, and I don't think it's the cause of our difficulty. So you don't think that the system has given rise to this situation? No. No, the system has uh, done its best to allay the situation, hmm. you know, be, because the system has uh, allowed uh, Republicans uh, to contend with Democrats and to present uh, contrary views and, uh, and to hold back the welfare state or to bring on a, a consciousness of its inadequacy to, our, to the forefront by refusing to, to, uh, to pay tax, uh, to uh, increase the necessary taxes. So you might say that's irresponsible of the Republicans not to raise the taxes. But then uh, they would answer, I think, that uh, if you raise taxes, that'll just allow the Democrats to raise benefits, and they won't pay off the debt. They'll, they'll increase it, end up increasing. That's, that's been seen. And so Milt Gingrich uh, famously said of the re previous Republican speaker that he became tax collector for the welfare state. So that, that is helped uh, that possibility of a split sort of within the government, divided government, has um, brought the arguments against the welfare state more to people's attention than, than otherwise would be the case. So when you said a minute ago, this is really interesting, that you think the system has been doing its job essentially because it's been warding off mm -hmm. an even worse situation, you might even mm -hmm. say. So when you view government now from a more philosophic perspective, do you see democratic systems in general as essentially doomed? And the purpose of a political system like our, the U.S. governmental system is precisely to ward off what seems to be inevitable in democratic yeah. systems. Well, I hope not. I, 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 th I think it's uh, part of our responsibility not to believe that. <laughs> okay. Not to believe that. Is that, that you're the doomed. psychological yeah. explanation? No, 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 no. I think that. Yeah, that's the moral explanation. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that there's there are certain things you mustn't think, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because it will keep you, it will paralyze you, it will keep you from acting and turn you into uh, an incompetent uh, incompetent observer. So, uh, yeah, we mustn't think that we're doomed. But it's true, uh, th I mean, this is a, a classic failing or end of democracy, the Roman Republic. Uh, same thing happened. Uh, the people became dependent on uh, booty from foreign conquests and stopped working on their own. Mm. So that, that's, that hasn't yet happened, and, and perhaps it won't. And, we should take measures to prevent it. <laughs> Still, uh, we're headed that way. Do you think that underlying malaise is ultimately cultural? And that it is, like you said, people not as hardworking, and therefore that you see one manifestation yeah, that, of that in the government? That's one of the, I mean, I've, I've been talking so far about the money, the, the debt mm -hmm. of the welfare state, but that, that's the other. Uh, the other aspect is moral hazard, uh, that, it, that being on welfare, and, and it isn't just being poor and being on welfare, but being middle class and getting government benefits saps your sense of self-reliance uh, and hmm. makes you dependent on the 
government, and this is happening to more and more people who have dropped out from the workforce. They're, they're not just unemployed, they're not even counted as unemployed, though they're not working. So they've, uh, they've a, a gathered little disabilities for themselves, uh, other ways of not working and, and, and uh, enjoying life. So you know, and that, that, this sort of moral deterioration under the welfare state is really, is really a, um, perhaps worse than, uh, than the economic. But um, I, I, wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't say that this is uh, um, cultural versus political. It's, it's the two together. Mm -hmm. I have this uh, far more ancient Aristotelian view <laughs> Of, uh, of government that it's um, that it r rules the country t in order to make a certain way of life and that ultimately uh, you know despite our, our liberal principles um, we live the way we're governed to live hmm. if we have if we live in a pluralist system that's because we have a government that wants that so it's still the case I think that politics is ultimately responsible for culture. Now I say ultimately hmm. because not always immediately. It doesn't mean that, uh, say, when the Republicans come in, they can immediately change the country, country's culture <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, force it to uh, vote for their measures or to believe in self-reliance instead of t government checks. But, um, but over time, I think it's the case that, that culture is, put, uh, at least I would put it this way, is not independent of, of politics. Mm -hmm. The way that I view that relationship is very much weighted on the cultural end as politics being kind of an outgrowth of mm -hmm. culture. But mm -hmm. I think it's certainly the case that at the very least, politics can negatively affect culture. I would say uh, that yeah. very strongly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say to somebody like myself yeah. that views the cultural malaise, uh -huh. the laziness you call it really, and the political debacle, and says my analysis is that the system allowed for this, therefore the system's to blame. What I would like to see is a a new group of people, or maybe to some group of people that have changed their minds, that want to be individualistic, self-reliant. Um, that's what I'd like to see, and I just don't. I, if that's what I'd like to see, it seems like we need some new type of governmental system. All right, that, but then that's you know, that's that's admitting the power, the power, and the necessity of government. So you you would have to change our education. Hmm. That's and to change our education, you would have to oust. The teachers' unions. Well, all this requires political motion and <laughs> and uh, action. Well, well. So what about something like this? It could be political in terms of a description, but not necessarily through getting elected and mm -hmm. going that route, but rather almost anti-political. So one idea that I would love to bring back that mm -hmm. unfortunately has a stigma is secession. People uh -huh. say, "Secession! Oh my gosh, it's a terrible idea." Well. Yeah. It, if we get the, uh -huh. rid of the stigma that's attached to it, it yeah. actually makes a great deal of sense that those who want to govern themselves in a particular way mm -hmm. can have their structure of government, and those mm -hmm. who, who want a complete opposite mm -hmm. system of government can have their structure of government. Yeah. I feel like that idea could really take hold. Well, that's, a different but name. that's just an, an extension of the idea of federalism. So we already have states that are, 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 have quite different governments and, and different results the red states versus the blue states, and then each, each of them is individually different in a way that uh, it's not too hard to see and, yeah, but it's and feel. But you know, on, on the other hand, I mean, who, what about our national security and uh, foreign policy? Don't we need uh, these secessionist states to hang together when it comes to uh, defending our country? My own disposition is to think probably not, but if so, uh -huh. There's nothing that p would prevent them from voluntarily colluding. It's not like we need the the mandatory oversight of the the Washington D.C. system 
um, to ward off the people. If the states, let's say, let's say we we had a minimal or non-existent federal government, the states could still associate with one another to try to defend against mm -hmm. foreign aggression. And my mm -hmm. my own libertarianism is much more radical than that. I I, I, I prefer to see <laughs> um, an evaporation the evaporation of, of the military. Uh, not the not services the, of the military, uh -huh. um, but the centralization of the yeah. military. So I, so I, I, like, <laughs> I like markets. Yeah. So I'd like markets to provide for those kind of things. All right. So we have a National Guard in addition to a federal <laughs> army. Those, the, the National Guard is by state. So, I mean, there's a little bit, <laughs> you know, uh, a little bit of, of uh, flexibility in your direction, I would say. But, um, well, you know, what you suggest didn't work very well during our Revolutionary War where we did have a league of states and uh, it was very hard to get them each individually to pay for the soldiers mm -hmm. or, to, or even to contribute to the number that they needed. And so at the end of it, uh, the Constitution came out with a fairly strong executive. Yeah, I think I don't, it would definitely have been interesting to see what would have happened um, had we still had the Articles of Confederation. I mean, that's just one of those counterfactuals that would be really hard yeah. to, to play out. But yeah. I, I, th in my disposition is to think the less power that governments have is probably the better. The more power that individuals mm -hmm. have, the more they feel like they're mm -hmm. in control of their lives, they're responsible for their decisions, for better or worse. Yeah. I feel like that's probably a good yeah. thing. Well, that, that, that's stated like that. One can agree. That's, uh, <laughs> that, that's what I call a free country. Okay. But well, it needs to be free in order to take some decisions uh, altogether, too. I think. So, yeah, yeah, it is good to have this, what the Catholics call subsidiarity, with uh, sort of semi-independent uh, regions and parts, um, which uh, make a lot of decisions on their own with variability and flexibility and and being close to the people mm -hmm. and so imposing or seeming to impose less than they do but still and then there's there is you know such a such a national culture now mm -hmm. um you know with tv and when when you turn on the tv you don't you know you'll have to find the local news to you know to keep you or to get you interested in what's going on in your city or your community. Yeah, it's even international, and, really, that, yeah, that culture. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so the result is a kind of separation between uh, your daily life and, and, and the politics that you're confronted with, which is, uh, <laughs> yeah, all around the world and, and, and certainly in the country. So I know a lot of your work has focused on welfare, on analyzing welfare and the impacts of welfare on uh, politics and on culture. I'd like to ask you a few questions just on that note, because a lot of people will criticize the idea of limited government in any capacity because they say, well, we have to take care of those who can't take, it, take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And my weak re reaction instinctively is to think, well, there's no reason why you have to have a safety net, let's say, provided by mm -hmm. a government. You can have all kinds of mm -hmm. voluntary community safety nets. Mm -hmm. How would you answer a question like that? Do you yeah, I would agree with you yeah. on that. That um, I mean, you could have a mix, but still, um, Republicans tend to uh, to favor uh, um, private charity and um, mm, church groups and and uh, other, other, other such groups who, um, which represent people coming together voluntarily to um, help those who really need the help. Uh, whereas the Democrats uh, don't like generosity as a virtue. They prefer justice. Justice has something compulsory about it, hmm. and they're perfectly willing to accept that in return for the universality of it. Generosity, they think, is too much hit or miss. So you might, it might work and it might not. Whereas if you have a government program, that can't miss. Ha ha. Mm -hmm. But uh, at any rate, in principle, it covers everybody in every situation. So you see that very much with the health care mm -hmm. issue now that um, um, 
universal is better, and, that, and, the, and therefore the, you kind of lower the motive because uh, uh, justice, when it become, becomes a law, uh, you can be just merely by obeying the law, and you're forced to. Whereas uh, with generosity, private generosity, you have to step up, and, uh, and you give yourself a lift uh, while doing that. And the Democrats say, well, that's bad too. They don't like people puffing themselves up because they have virtues that most people or other people don't have. So uh, you need something, you need a solution which is universal and therefore equal. And uh, the only way you can get equal is to bring more a little, a little bit or more and more coercion into it. So, because liberty always produces inequalities. Mm -hmm. Some people are better at certain things and not, than others. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what it means to be an individual. Uh, it's to be unequal. If you're different from others, then you're good at better at some things and worse at others. Or maybe better at most things. So, liberty leads in the direction of inequality, elites, um, you can say the elites, I mean, the, the cure for elite is elites, the, the plural, <laughs> because the, uh, that, I mean, that, this is very much the American way, I think, that uh, yeah, we, uh, we and as opposed to most other, and certainly most classical democracies, we give a lot of leeway to, sorry, to ambition, um, which is a kind of passion in each person that makes him want to be outstanding or to excel or to make himself better um, than, um, than the kind of equality which has to be enforced through uh, compulsion. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I say you have, to, you have to have a democracy that's more tolerant of inequality than, than that which insists on everyone's being equal. So, but everyone's being equal is a, seems to be the main idea of a democracy, so it's, it's hard, to, hard to achieve. As Tocqueville says, uh, a democratic people has a passion for a, a equality and a taste for liberty. <laughs> so, a passion is stronger than a taste. So, that, and that's the, that's, that's, that's the problem. So when you gave that analysis um, of how the Democrats view welfare and compulsion, do you think that that is something they would agree with? That, that way that that is phrased? Yes, I, that, I meant this. Think I think yes. they would. I think they would. They would say that justice is is better than generosity. So in that, and they do that. They practice that. By the way, there's a, a book written by Arthur Brooks uh, on the. On the two parties and their ways of of generosity, and he, had, he summed it up in this comparison between the city of San Francisco, which is rich and liberal, and this state of South Dakota, which is po much poorer and conservative, and they have about the same population. And South Dakota gives three times the charity that San Francisco gives per year. So, so it, it is, that is, I think, a big difference in the parties. So when you, I, I, that certainly, that analysis is in accordance with the experiences and conversations and relationships that I have with people who I think are more disposed towards liberalism, um, modern liberalism. But if that's true, and that's a very popular uh, disposition to have, mm -hmm. then doesn't that again kind of um, condemn to some extent the long run viability of a democratic system because I think we also see demonstrated over and over that in the long run the welfare system mm -hmm. um, r is not sustainable it does it doesn't work it's a short run yeah. win and it's a long term disaster right so is, isn't that doesn't that distress you I think that's true so that's why. We're going to have to learn the virtues of austerity, hmm. <laughs> um, because that, I mean, 
Yeah, you know, choice is a wonderful thing, but one doesn't always have it. <laughs> so, <laughs> if and if, and, yeah, that's, and that that's a, a difficulty with uh, libertarianism too. I think that it, there are necessities as well as choices. Sometimes you have a choice as to how to deal with a necessity, but still you have to do. And necessity is a kind of compulsion. Even if it's not from the government, it's mm -hmm. something you're forced, as they say, you're forced to do. So, one, I'd like to, to transition a bit to what we were talking about kind of at the beginning about political correctness and also your career. So, you have been in academia and higher ed for more than half a century mm -hmm. in, at Harvard, mm -hmm. kind of the thick of it all. Do you see the modern trend towards political correctness and the chilling of free speech on campus? Mm -hmm. Do you, does that distress you as much as somebody like myself, being a young person, knowing a lot of people on campuses, mm -hmm. some of the antics that are going on with uh, political correctness are really uh -huh. distressing. And, and part of the reason I'm doing this series and part of the reason I'm doing my work is because I'm thinking, I don't want to touch that stuff with a 10-foot pole. I don't want to be part of that system. I want to try to avoid it altogether. Mm -hmm. Is this something, is this based on my naivete not being around long enough to see that this is what happens, or is this something genuinely unique? To our time. Well, I think it's been building up to this. So, uh, since the late 60s, the late 60s is when I, when it got started. The late 60s were very much characterized by antics, as you say. By protest and rebellion, and sort of uh, lack of conformity, anti-conformism, so all that was nice and good. But unfortunately, those people, once they got into power or into tenured professorships, um, have uh, produced a kind of soft despotism. Again, if I can mention Tocqueville again, um, uh, that. That is uh, endemic in uh, in democracy and uh, and getting worse and worse in ours. So uh, n right now you don't see anything like the protest of the late '60s. And when I mentioned the, the, the way it was, I, since I lived through it, to students today, they're open-mouthed at at the. Uh, it's more than hijinks at the disrespect. Really, for for uh, for mind, for think, and for thought. You're saying back yeah, then. Yeah, back then. Yeah, um, that was shown in these actions, and and also just uh, disreputable manners, the way people dressed and so. On. But n n now uh, the ideas are there. There's tremendous disrespect for mind in our ideas, mm -hmm. but um, there there isn't the there isn't the rebelliousness that used to go with it. And, and the reason is, is that it's worse because there's, there's nothing to rebel against. Right. You know, they, they were rebelling not against uh, conservatives in the late 60s, but against liberals, against Cold War liberals, against, uh, uh, well, they, they, they were the ones who first picked up the word establishment, establishment liberals who were at that time in charge of the universities, and they accused those liberals of being complicit in the Vietnam War, hmm. and the horrors and injustices of that conflict. So, uh, th and they were, uh, so, so that was what they accomplished, and now uh, it's, a, it's a new liberalism. Uh, the, the new left has become what are today called liberals. So it's a combination of the old uh, welfare state liberalism with a new relativism and that goes with a sort of an, a weak accommodating foreign policy that's uh, afraid to stand up to bullies. So when you, it's hard to believe for me, um, just based on my own limited experience, I was in school six years ago now, so it wasn't even that recent. Um, but when you see the, I don't know if protest is the right word, but when conservative speakers will come to campus, the students will essentially blockade them and say, you can't be here, or mm -hmm. they'll shout them down. That mm -hmm. kind of stuff, you think, it was even worse back 
back in the sixties. We've been there, seen that. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, that, that it was much more hostile and and um, and force forcible. Um, you know, for example, uh, the students at Harvard uh, occupied the left uh, SDS students for a democratic society occupied University Hall where all the deans had. they took those deans and uh, and hustled them out of their own offices wow. and stayed there for uh, about three weeks until they were uh, taken out rather forcibly themselves by state police so that wow. that kind of thing hasn't happened and that and that's and the reason it hasn't happened the one reason is because they don't need to these deans, they can they can bully they they can bully around. They don't need to oust them for our, right. or kick them out of their offices. Uh, so they'll just do what uh, they demand. Um, the the deans will do what the students demand without their having to to push them. So, I'm I'm in the past several months I've been trying to co overcome my own pessimism mm -hmm. about both the state of politics, the state of the culture, mm -hmm. the state of higher ed and the intelligentsia, when, if it's the case that the people in the 60s who were these radicals eventually got the tenure, became the, the professors, my suspicion is the same thing is going to happen with these students mm -hmm. that are going to get the tenure, raise up their generation of relativist uh, uh, students. Well, but, but without changing their views, you mean, because, um, yeah. yeah. So that seems very bleak. The, the, the new left was ushered into the university by the old liberals, whom they, whom the new left opposed. So, out of their liberal toleration, these are young people, and the young are wonderful, and so we need to support them. But uh, you don't get that view now. Right. So that's what political correctness is. It's a, the exclusion of conservatives, and who want the 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 place of the old liberals is now being taken on by conservatives. This strikes me as very bleak, though. I mean, the, the I, do you it, foresee? It is, it is bleaker, yeah. in a way. Yeah. yeah. Right. And um, one keeps looking for signs of hope. <laughs> uh, it's true that uh, the students who come in are more, um, more various, more uh, uh, um, I said open-minded than either the faculty or the administration. Really? The new students? Or yeah, the, the new oh, students who okay. just arrive here. I mean, well, they're very soon, their minds are often closed down. Right, that's right. Very right, quickly, but, uh, <laughs> but not all of them. Okay. And so, uh, it's still, therefore, it's still worth teaching. And uh, so you can still get, get young people intelligent young people to listen. Yeah. But um, uh, otherwise, and then who knows what will happen with, as a consequence of, the, uh, of this chaotic political situation. Or who knows, maybe I'm wrong about chaotic, maybe it's just going to be uh, more and more stagnant. It could be the opposite. Mm -hmm. with, uh, and, and bad things will happen uh, gradually rather than noticeably and all at once. But, um, you know, I, I, it's hard to look forward, at least to the near future, to the foreseeable future, with confidence. There is, I think, one bright spot with the Internet, that there's a lot of people like myself, and there's a, I think there's a growing movement of... <laughs> The, the the new counterculture yeah. is against the relativism, the progress, the extreme yeah. progressivism yeah. on campus, and I think that movement is growing. I think we've hit mm -hmm. a point where the pendulum has flung, uh, uh -huh. been so far to the left that people are, see some of the absurdities, some of the philosophic barrenness yeah. of relativism. Well, it, specifically, uh, yeah, I hope so. But the internet has also been used by Trump. That's true, <laughs> <laughs> very effectively, and uh, and by. Uh, ISIS and Putin and so and it's all and it's used too as a way of bullying and intimidating mm -hmm. um, individuals you know the trouble with the internet is that you're not there with the person that you're talking with and so you don't feel um, the same sense of uh, solidarity you're, you're um, 
yeah, it's nice to have somebody who agrees with you, but that that's that's not as good as being with that person. It's true. And, and that that um, so you're you're still very much an individual facing a mass. That 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 I think is a is the main difficulty. And we, what we need are these intermediate groups. This is uh, again what I think libertarianism needs to appreciate more. <laughs> the, the need of the need for uh, associations, voluntary associations, that take the edge off compulsion, and the edge off universality, and the edge off equality, and, and make it uh, make those three things more livable. I think there's also uh, it's a smaller amount, but there's also a lot of people who are part of the the, inter the new internet culture that see um, the. Uh, they call it trolling, that, that people are just being complete jerks to one another. But I think it develops a kind of, you have to have a, a certain measure of thick skin that I think is becoming yeah. more and more common where people say, yeah, that's just the internet and therefore it doesn't get to people. Uh, as if, I mean, if people on the street were talking to you the way that people on the internet would be talking to you, it would uh, be horrendous, but we uh, just go, ah, it's the internet. Uh -huh. you know? <laughs> okay. I'll accept your, uh, your assurance. <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, uh, yeah. thanks so much for talking to me. This has been great. My pleasure. Okay, that was my interview with Dr. Harvey Mansfield of Harvard University. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I certainly did. And I really can't wait to do a breakdown of this episode. There were lots of really interesting little nuggets of wisdom. Some things, as you can imagine, I disagreed with. But it's great to hear the insight of somebody who's been in the political scene for, like I said, more than twice as long as I've been in existence. All right, that's all for me. I hope you guys have a great day.